Um, welcome to the meeting of the City Service Committee. I'm Councillor Marianne Labarge, Chair, and I'm joined by Ward 2 Councillor Karen Foster, who is the Vice Chair, Ward 7 City Councillor Rachel Muir, and Ward 1 City Councillor Michael Quinlan. I am required to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Laura, will you call the roll? Sure. Councillor Foster? Here. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Here. And Councillor Quinlan? Here. Okay, next on the agenda, public comment. So is there any member of the public who would like to address the committee on any subject? There's no one here but Apparently, us. Apparently there's no public being present, so there is no public comment. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of October 5th, 2020. Move to approve the minutes of October 5th, 2020. Second. Is there any discussion? We have a motion made and seconded. Roll call, Laura. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. <clears throat> okay. We are joined today by welcoming Sarah Banker of Collaborative of for Education Services on Grant Project Redesigning Power Structures. We have invited Sarah as part of an informational request from us counselors. And we all want to learn about your presentation today because to be honest with you it's the first time i've ever even heard about this so i want to thank counselor rachel Moore for bringing that up a great idea rachel um but anyways what i'm asking for is that if there are going to be any questions to be asked by the counselors i prefer that they be asked after sarah does her presentation please thank you sarah welcome you can do your presentation. Hi everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to the City Services Committee. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. I've made you co-host, so let me know if you have a tr trouble. Oh, looks like it's gonna work. Good. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I'm not going to be able to see you all very easily when I go through this. So just if something goes wrong or um, you have to tell me something, please just speak up and interrupt me. I won't be able to see you. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm here. I'm going to give a presentation about a new grant um, that is um, being held by the collaborative that um, the city of Northampton is an unofficial partner on and I say unofficial because we haven't really had a process yet by which we sort of have asked people or partners or agencies to officially sign on to anything but um, in the proposal and program design stages of this I was in touch with um, mainly uh, Wayne Fiden and the Office of Planning um, who we have collaborated with for a long time and so um, Anyway, I'll just give a brief sort of overview to situate this and then I'll go through and talk about um, sort of what the grant is um, going to involve. It's a very high level at this point. Um, we're definitely in a stage of starting to flesh out details, but we haven't put those in presentation form yet. Um, and then after I do the presentation, I don't know um, what you all were hoping for, but I was kind of hoping that we might be able to have a conversation about what you've been up to and the types of conversations you've had at the city services um, committee about some of the topics that this grant will be looking at. Um, because right now I would say I'm sort of just in a, um, a sponge 
uh, mode where I'm sopping up information um, from potential partners and really trying to understand, you know, how to begin to shape this grant in a way that's going to be most useful for those who are very interested in doing this kind of work. Um, should I be mindful of, um, of time limits or, um, I wasn't sure, I don't have the agenda in front of me to know how much time I have for the presentation. We, we didn't assign a time. I know there's at least an hour for the meeting and only have two appointments after this. Okay, so the presentation part will probably just be 10 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes. So that should be fine. Um, so um, to start with, so I work through the Collaborative for Educational Services, um, also known as CES. Um, many of you might be familiar with CES. Um, uh, a lot of the work that CES does is in the realm of education and education support for school districts in Hampshire and Franklin County, as well as professional development. But there's also a department at CES um, that's really focused on public health and community health. And um, I like to say that part of the reason is because it links to the mission around supporting students, but it's also because lacking a county health structure, um, there's not a lot of places for regional public health grants like this. Um, this grant is a good example to go. And so the collaborative, we have a, a department there, the Department of Healthy Families and Communities, um, holding many different types of grants, um, including a grant for the Spiffy Coalition and also a grant um, for Healthy Hampshire, which is another program I work on that some of you might have heard of. And so this um, particular grant is actually coming out of that department at the collaborative. And I just wanted to sort of help you understand why CES was involved. Um, the title, let's see. Yeah, maybe I'll just go next here. So the, sorry, go, oops, there we go. So this grant is actually um, coming from the Massachusetts um, Community Health and Healthy Aging Funds. Um, and you can, um, if you want to know more about this fund program, I won't go into it now, but you can click on that link or copy it down. Um, essentially, it's, um, it's uh, a new grant program, and it's really, um, the mission is sort of laid out here. You can read it yourself, but it's really about looking at those structures and institutions um, that are really um, been designed and to some degree perpetuating um, racism, poverty, and other types of power imbalances. And that's why we see um, so much pervasive health inequities in our communities. And so this grant is really looking, taking a, a, a real spotlight onto those institutions and saying, how can we actually restructure them in a way um, that has that end result of um, increasing health equity. And so there's a health component here, although it is, it is looking at systems across the community. Um, so a lot of the grants are actually, you know, focused on housing, for example. Um, some are substance abuse, some, um, you know, are the food system. In this case, we've actually decided to not look at a particular institution other than sort of the institutions that people engage through in order to uh, participate in our democracy. And so um, the idea here around redesigning power structures is actually to look at um, how people engage in governance systems and also how people engage in decision making processes and how we can really um, grow both in terms of representation, power and inclusion, people who are most impacted by, um, you could say most impacted by health inequities. Um, we also just say impacted, you know, by racism, um, by poverty, um, and by other systems of oppression. And so, um, again, you can learn more about this particular fund. It is through the Massachusetts Department of Public Health Determination of Need program. Um, it's actually a pretty cool redistribution of funds out here west, where it would normally have actually been uh, focused in, in on Boston. But that's kind of a it's a longer story, but you can read up on it um, through their website. Um, so I alluded to the purpose of this grant already. I'll just, um, you know, sort of reiterate, we, we intend to work collaboratively to address um, what in public health we call the social determinants of health, um, which are really the root causes of, of health, um, address health inequities and address structural racism 
We want to intervene at the level of governance or decision making. We want to increase the role that historically and currently underrepresented groups, including youth, play in local and regional policy setting processes. Um, and so there's two ways that we have envisioned that we will do this by. Um, we will both support underrepresented groups and individuals to engage with and become decision makers and policy setters in their communities. Um, so we, we sort of call that like, for lack of a better term, grass, like a grassroots leadership development approach. Um, and then um, we also will, will be working with um, supporting partner agencies and municipalities to really look at their culture, their policies and their practices to understand how to shift them in a way that helps them to become more welcoming and inclusive of the communities that they are there to represent. So sometimes I just like to say some of the assumptions that, um, that, and maybe I can even back up and say, you know, this framework I think was developed through numerous conversations and several uh, community meetings that we held last, actually almost a year ago when we were in the proposal development process. And so this doesn't actually represent only my vision, but actually it represents the vision of number of um, agency partners and community leaders and community residents who came together to help us craft that proposal. And so um, I, I just want to say a couple of assumptions I think we all have um, as we conceived of this um, vision are that you know we are we are stronger and healthier as a society when we have full participation in decision making particularly by people most impacted by the issues um, we actually surface more effective solutions when those people are part of the change making process um, we in some ways have a culture that fragments and segregates groups and so we actually have to do the hard work of learning how to work together like we don't just we actually can't just come together and work together. We don't actually know how to do that. Um, and so part of that is about like a learning that has to happen. Um, and we have to work together across difference, um, you know, both in terms of identities, but also differences in power. There's, that's a huge piece of this. And we, we sort of have been intentional about trying to name power without getting sucked into power or the dynamics of power, um, but really wanna be talking about it because we think that's sort of an unnamed piece of this whole equation. Um, and then we, we also really feel like people most impacted by issues more or less already know what's wrong and what to do about it, but it's more about resources. Um, they need resources to move to action. Um, certainly capacity and learning and growth and education are all part of that. Um, but we assume that people already sort of have a sense of what needs to change and that and that, um, and that resources are really the main way in which, um, maybe the main barrier, I would say, to, um, to, to their involvement in whatever process they wanna be involved in. And then when we allow power to be concentrated in the hands of a few, our collective health suffers. So we sort of all suffer as part of that, um, that concentration of power. You're probably wondering, um, so that's, that's a lot of, amazingly grand statements. What does this really look like? Um, some of that's going to still to be determined, but um, the general gist of it is that, you know, there's a lot of work around developing partnerships with individuals, groups, and organizations. And so this grant is five years. And so we're really looking at a longer term effort to shift culture and practice. We know so much is going on right now around civic engagement and participation in our democracy. And there's many opportunities to kind of work on things right now, um, which is really exciting. And also we think this is sort of a unique um, grant in that we, we are, in, at least in public health, we have, often don't have five-year grants to do this kind of thing. And so we're really looking at partnerships that want to kind of be along for that journey, um, that longer term journey. We do plan to use the bulk of the grant to offer trainings, um, learning opportunities. Uh, we, again, not sure exactly how it will all be structured, but, you know, peer-to-peer -peer modeling and mentorship, um, really looking at creating that community of practice. Um, so we understand that, like, in Hampshire County, there's already lots of great work going on. There's people are, you know, trying different types of experiments. We really want to just be able to um, find ways to help both 
uh, bring people together so they understand, so they can actually learn um, what each of them are doing. And so we kind of can build our, our, I would say, best or better practices here um, from what's already happening. And then to also look at like, well, what would it take for us to take another step forward in that, like to go a little closer to the edge, uh, to do a little bit more experimentation and risk taking around this type of work, um, because we know that that's really the only way we learn and grow. And so um, some of it will be about understanding, you know, what is going on in other places as well and learning about that. And then, you know, a lot of training and training sounds like such a dry word, but we're really hoping it can be, you know, feel pretty dynamic um, and that it can be the type of training that comes when you really need it in the way that you need it. Um, and as part of that, we plan to hire a full-time person to, to, to be that trainer, that sort of like um, in-house trainer type of person. So they might be available for formal trainings, but also lots of informal um, ways. Um, and then, you know, looking at, okay, like what are the pathways by which people, groups, and organizations um, go in order to actually make some change in this area? Um, how do they know they're uh, following the path? How do they, what do the milestones look like? I think that when we talk about increasing <clears throat> representation and inclusion um, at the level of governance, um, a lot of us don't really know what that actually looks like and how do we know we're actually making headway? Because sometimes, you know, progress can feel very circuitous and, you know, it could be like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And so um, how do we sort of collectively build those, and there's many different pathways too, um, I think, to making that happen. Um, so we are going to be charting, um, charting this boat while we're um, driving it. You know, there's going to be a lot of um, doing and learning and growing at the same time. Um, so here we are in our timeline. Um, gosh, I think when I put this presentation together, it was in July and it felt like there was so much time. And now there's not. Um, so we're in the midst of a hiring process um, that is a little slow going. Um, so I, um, I can actually share with you all, um, maybe via Laura, um, a job posting if you haven't seen it yet. Still definitely uh, looking for um, that full time person that has the right skills for this position. So we had hoped that maybe we might have someone in place in November and it, I don't think it'll be until at least late December, if not the new year. Um, we are wanting to hear back from partners about the, um, the way that engagement is already is happening for them around COVID-19 community engagement in particular, because I think um, in the second half of this year, we will be looking at a strategic planning process. And so we want to sort of plan now for, um, unfortunately, it's, I think largely, if not completely virtual engagement, um, but this is the time when we're um, kind of looking at resources to um, get people what they need to engage in, in virtually, whether that be actual like techno technological resources and then also methods for doing that in, you know, ways that are effective and engaging um, and don't feel like just another Zoom meeting. So um, we want to identify pilot projects to continue to nurture to some degree within my department that's already happening. We are all involved in different types of community engagement and sort of experimental models around decision making. And so we're doing a lot of work just reflecting on our own. But I think that um, we, we hope in, you know, probably it'll be a little bit more in the second half of the year to have a little bit more of a structured way that that can happen with, um, with maybe a, a next circle of partners. Um, and then looking at what an assessment of what's already happening, best practices, models, and frameworks, which is sort of just, it's already underway. It's mostly through me um, collecting in spreadsheet form um, lots of information about what's going on out there and then what's happening here. We hope in the uh, second half of the year, not hope, but we, we are planning um, on doing a partnership convening and a strategic planning process. So I think part of the reason why we don't have a ton of um, real clarity about like what the nuts and bolts of this are going to look like is because we want to build it with partners. Um, and we want to actually do that in a inclusive governance fashion to the extent that we can, um, given the time frame. Um, so we're thinking, I think a lot of internally right now about what that can look like virtually in a way that sort of brings together quite a lot of a broad spectrum of people and partners into that planning process. 
Um, and then so by the end of the fiscal year, we'll have a pretty clear plan about how we're going to use the next four years. Here are some potential impacts we hope to see um, for sure. Um, a big one is increased representation and decision making power by adults and youth who are most impacted by health inequities um, to serve on municipal and nonprofit governance structures. So that's sort of our target here. Um, I would probably expand that to say and in any decision making process because we know that it might be some time before we really see this impact. Um, especially on municipal boards and committees. I mean, it's no small feat to join a, a board or a committee. Um, and we, and, and in the interim, I think we'd be looking at just seeing increased engagement in decision making processes, whether that be, you know, planning department doing a community engagement process and really, you know, looking at um, uh, some different practices there. Um, or, you know, surveys or different ways that we routinely engage the community how we can all um, sort of employ additional um, tools and practices to broaden um, that engagement. Um, and I also just want to emphasize the youth piece here. So I don't particularly work in youth development myself, um, but um, we do hope to sort of have a tailored and um, specific youth component, youth engagement component to this initiative as well. And that might look a bit different than the adult engagement portion of it. Um, so we hope to see stronger and more health protective social environments. Again, this is sort of a public health framed grant. And so we made this pitch that like when people are actually particularly residents on the resident side of things or people who are sort of impacted by decisions or community leaders, when they are actually um, more connected to one another and organizing together and building their social capital um, by having more agency and being involved in their community and the decision making, they, that's actually like um, a very health protective activity for them and for their community in general. So we, we, we would hope to see that and we're kind of curious about how we might actually evaluate that. Um, still don't really know, but um, that's what we're aiming for here. Um, we, we definitely want to see impacts on policy systems and environmental changes. So again, we don't want to be too prescriptive about people coming into this work, you know, grassroots leaders coming into this work. Oh, you have to work in this area. You have to, you know, be involved in that topic area, but more like emphasizing being involved in decision making processes that really like are impacting policy systems and environmental changes, because those are really the changes that are going to be sustained over time. Um, and those are the changes that really impact people's health. Um, and certainly some of our training would be focused on that, um, targeting changes in those realms. We hope to see more shared power models within organizations and we would, as part of this process, certainly be developing and looking at best practices and models around shared power. Um, and then ultimately, really effectively addressing the root causes of poor health. Um, and that would be due to shifts in organizational and government cultures um, that are more informed and responsive to community need. These are our potential partners. Certainly municipalities are a big one. Um, also nonprofit boards and agencies, healthcare boards and agencies. Um, informal community groups um, and individuals of any kind. And, you know, we're not really limiting our partners. I mean, certainly even businesses could potentially be a part of this or co-ops. Um, but these are the partners that we've sort of envisioned this with so far. And um, we see them, I would say, as our primary partners. And that's it. This is my contact information. Um, if you'd like to um, reach out to me, I'm, you know, again, in this sort of exploration, hearing from very open, hearing from people. We haven't started our strategic planning process, so we, it's actually a really great time to hear from people who are really excited about this work um, because it's um, every conversation I have is sort of helping me think through and shape the next um, phase of this grant. So I'm always open to, to being in touch with people. So I guess I'll stop share for a second and then if we need to go back to any 
um, slide I can always reshare. There. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, very, very much for that presentation. It was very helpful. Uh, I'm going to open the floor now to questions or comments from the counselors, which would be some brief questions and answers. So, counselors, if you would like to ask questions, the floor is open. Karen. Hey, excuse, excuse any background noise here. I have two young children and a puppy I'm in charge of. <laughs> um, Sarah, thank you so much. This is great. And um, it's really exciting to learn about this grant and the work you're doing. And one question that came up for me while you were presenting, and I, I have more, but um, the first one I have framed is around, I think one barrier very often to um, underrepresented groups participating is, um, is also finances, whether it's um, child care or like you said, technology or transportation um, to meetings. And I didn't know if this grant in any way could help with some of, with some of that barrier. Yeah, it's a great question. And it kind of gets back to the point I made about like, people mostly experience, I think, um, from what I've seen, and in my own life, too, this is true. Um, resources are the biggest barrier, like, yeah, like, just financial or transportation, um, those kinds of resources, just time, I think, is a big one, too. Um, and so as part of the grant, we built in quite a lot of money for um, stipends, transportation, child care. I think there's money in there for food. Of course, transportation and food may not be needed this year, but we assume in future years um, for people participating in the grant. And so, um, as I said, we haven't fleshed it all out, but like, let's say we might have a cohort of um, emerging leaders or something that, you know, um, are going through a program and that they might be resourced to be in that program and to begin to step into um, you know, uh, positions of leadership. Um, but the grant is not meant to like permanently support people in those positions, right? Um, and it is a five-year grant. And so part of this, I think, is about looking at municipal policy around that too. And, and trying to begin to sort of crack that really tough nut of like, knowing that if we want to um, look at equitable practices, we need to look at resourcing people, but municipal budgets are incredibly strained. And it's not like there's some big slush fund that you can just, you know, take over it and put in that, you know, bucket. So how, how do we begin to talk about what that looks like? Where, how, what are the policies that might need to shift or the practices that might need to shift? And then like, how would you practically actually support people? Um, because to some degree, all of us need that type of support, right? And so like who gets it and who doesn't? So it's like, I imagine that would take at least a year or two or three. I mean, that's like a big conversation. And I know I'm, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if you all ha are having it or have had it. And I know other um, boards have had it too. Um, so it's kind of a conversation I imagine that we would all be having together over time. And, be, and, and while we do that, the grant can support people who are actually part of this program to, to engage. So there's, and, and maybe there's data that comes out of that, right? Maybe those people actually help us understand what, what support they generally need so we can better craft a policy that then supports people, right? Councilor Quinlan, did you want to speak? I, I did. Um, I, I wasn't sure. Uh, Councilor Foster, are you, are you good? Um, I'll have more follow-up, but on that particular one, yes, I'm, I'm good. Okay, so. okay. Thank you. So uh, my question kind of ties together uh, a couple of the, the points that you made, Sarah, during that response, um, which is uh, you mentioned that you have a job posting now. Um, so you're, you're working on this grant. You're going to hire somebody else. And then you mentioned during the presentation that you'd be hiring a trainer uh, as well. I'm just trying to understand like the, the kind of the breadth of the of the grant uh, financially for staffing versus services like like Councilor Foster asked about versus services and, and resources for participants. Uh, and then also um, just in, a, in addition to that, um, you know, what you see, I mean, if North, Northampton becomes a partner on this, right, and this is, you know, you mentioned we're an unofficial partner now, but uh, if we become an official partner, what would be the city's responsibility uh, as a partner? 
Yeah, those are great questions. So um, we're only hiring one person, and that is the, a person who would predominantly be coming in with a training background and do a lot of the training. Um, and so I would be um, part time. I'm already sort of I'm already part time, although I've got like three other part time. <laughs> you know how it is when you're kind of like in a transition. So I'm I'm currently the point person. Um, this full time hire would become uh, the point person, but I would also be working with them. But they would really be bringing skills that I don't currently have. I mean, I I can facilitate and convene, and I can do all kinds of things. But I really am not a trainer. I I wouldn't know how to do an advocacy one on one training, for example. Um, and so that's the type of skills I think we're looking for here is someone, and also someone who's really passionate about civic engagement. Um, so that's so it's like really a I would say one and a half FTE would be supported by the grant. Um, and then there's also money for partners that we haven't decided exactly how to use. So besides money for participants or community leaders, there's money for partners, which would be like agency or municipal partners. Um, so there's a lump of money there, but we're not really sure what that would be used for. Um, because again, I think the strategic planning process will help us understand how best to use that money. Like I think, you know, we've heard um, unofficially say, for example, that like a small nonprofit who really wants to do this work, but they're always engaged in emergency services. So they never have, they don't have like a PD budget, like a professional development budget, right? Even if we offer free training, it's not like they have money that they can actually pay their staff to go, right? So maybe for them, it might be like, we just need like a small stipend to help our staff attend. Um, another idea that's been out there is just um, like, essentially uh, providing money for experiments and pilot projects that um, partners are doing. And so they're sort of in a more of a doing mode, like, um, and then as part of that, their responsibility is to like work with us and communicate back with us what they're learning in those experiments. So those are just some like ideas that have been tossed out there. Um, I don't wanna um, say where it's gonna go yet because again, we wanna have our process um, and then you had a second question, which was, I can't quite remember. Well, if, I, if I could actually paraphrase the, the second question, actually not even paraphrase, I'm gonna be more direct. Um, one of the things that we discussed when the health, the health, the Board of Health here in Northampton declared racism as a public health emergency, and we uh, as a city council put forward a uh, anti-racism, um, you know, uh, resolution as well. And one of the things that was proposed in it uh, was an office, and I know Councilor Foster actually uh, added to what I was talking about, like an office of uh, equality, uh, an office of sort of, um, you know, overall sort of understanding of, of equality. And Councilor Foster at the time pointed out that maybe the city wouldn't have money for that specifically as an office, but maybe as one person or something. And I'm wondering if you would see part of your grant funding, maybe something like that, uh, you know, for us uh, as a starter. Mm hmm and again, yeah, I understand and, you're not committing, you're not committing to anything here. I just am asking the question if that's <laughs> kind of what you envision it being. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I would say my best guess at this point is I would say our initiative is really meant to say partner with the city to think about what you need and whether it would be best served by a position like that and then how you would work within a municipal budget or maybe external grant funds to actually make that happen um, rather than like our grant going to fund like a position it's really we're really about building capacity and working with everyone in a learning process to um, to figure out some of these tough situations right and to really like I can imagine maybe um, This is just like a, and I like, let's say um, there's a couple of municipalities that are thinking about the same thing. So I could imagine like bringing a speaker or someone from a organization or a municipality that already has that type of position, like coming to speak to you about that. But then it would become like a broader Hampshire County conversation where everyone can learn about that. You know, so, so it's always trying to, we're, I think we're trying to position this grant so that it's, it's about building capacity um, rather than trying to actually come in and do the work for you or provide the resources directly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. It does. That, that's a very yeah. good answer to that. I thank you. 
And that's exciting, by the way, that um, that idea is on the table. Um, it's really interesting. Sarah, I'm getting, um, I, I just want to, um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm still the host, but I'm getting, um, I'm getting a message that someone's in the waiting room. Should I maybe? Oh, Laura, you're muted. Turn my host duties over. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was looking at my minutes, so I didn't notice because we generally feel free to admit someone if they come in and you see them and I don't. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, you're now on our on the committee, Sarah. <laughs> we've already we've, we're already opening up our inclusion. <laughs> this happened at another municipal meeting too, not in Northampton. But oh, yeah. I was like, I realized, oh, I had I had the the sole duty to admit someone because they <laughs> my hosting they they turned their hosting duties all the way over to me and they didn't co-host. Oh. So they didn't even oh. see that. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I believe Councillor Barge had a comment or a question. I have some as well, but I, Councillor Barge, did you have something? Yeah, if you want to go ahead, Rachel, you can go ahead and talk right uh, now. I'll no, my head is just spinning. I just think this is a really unique um, opportunity and grant, and it, I just, I'm kind of like really excited now that I know more about it. I'd heard a little bit about it, but I mean, five years, I just love that. I mean, it really, because, you know, when you work in health, you know, it, things take a long time, especially when they're multi-dimensional um, and I think it will be a great way to really spotlight how health is affected by um, by um, all excuse me next one. Um, how, how community health is affected by um, representation and involvement and participation I'm really excited about that aspect of it uh, um, and yeah I was just thinking you know it, we've had this conversation just to share with you we when we were setting up the Policing Review Commission. And it was very important to us that it truly represent um, aspects of the community and really draw it through from um, uh, communities that are most impacted by, negatively by um, policing. So it was, we had to have these conversations and um, how to do that. And do you, you know, we had seats for, uh, that we reserved for people of color, people are most impacted. But then we did talk about, you know, stipends and all that because it's tough. I, I've been going, I sometimes I listen in on their, I attend their meetings and, um, you know, it's people who aren't necessarily set up for a municipal life for, you know, six hour meetings and, you know, they have young kids. And uh, so it really got me thinking about how you do that, how you, how you offer, provide resources. Um, so interesting that you kind of confirm my hunch, which is it's really, that part isn't so complicated. And I mean, it's complicated to know what to do about it, but it really is about resources. I mean, uh, and I'm glad you included time. I hadn't thought of it that way. I was thinking money and childcare, um, but time as well. So I think this is really exciting. I, I've got to keep, my head is going to keep spinning about this. I don't really know that I have, I had a question about partner agencies, but I think you've kind of answered that. I was wondering what, what, you, what you meant by partner agencies, but um, yeah. Um, yeah. Just wanted to share that. <laughs> Are you finished, Counselor? I am. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Sarah, you mentioned nonprofit boards. Could you give me some detail on what type of nonprofit boards you would be looking at? Like community action and so forth like that? Or um, yeah, I mean I think it could be any kind of nonprofit board that wanted to be involved in some way. I think we've we've had strong interest um, expressed in this grant from a couple of different types of nonprofits in the area. Um, but again, like I said, we haven't formalized what partnership looks like, but I could say imagine that um, the journey for say a, a nonprofit, particularly maybe more on the smaller side, um, that would participate in this grant might look like a nonprofit that's sort of interested in looking at expanding representation yeah. and in inclusion on their board 
um, or and or within uh, the the design and the uh, implementation of their programs. So it, it could be both, right? Because nonprofits are always in this phase of like, how do we do this? How do we do? And how do we get people involved in giving us inform information about what works for them, right? And so I could see I could see us partnering with a nonprofit in, on, on that level, but then I could also see us partnering with a nonprofit um, with them saying, we really want to change what our board looks like. And we want to go through this learning process together. And at the end of five years, we'd really like to see some significant shifts. And them being involved from the beginning will really impact the type of trainings we offer, right? Let's say there are a number of nonprofits and they all have the same types of barriers. So then we begin to understand how to, what types of trainings that need to be offered. And then, you know, I can imagine maybe there's commitments made by, by those agencies. And maybe there's even a way that we can do matchmaking between leaders that are coming through a program and those boards um, that are looking for ways to really increase representation, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I, again, I don't want to, um, I don't want to say this is definitely what it's, what's going to happen, but like, you know, I could see pa a pairing happening, right? So that people who are emerging into leadership positions feel really supported, and then they know they're going into a board that's really done some work around the culture of that board. And <clears throat> they've done their work around how to welcome people who maybe aren't resourced in the same ways they are, um, who maybe hold identities different from the predominant identity of that board, or who um, have some really different ideas about how the board could function or what the programs could look like within that nonprofit. And so how do we create that culture of inclusion within that board such that that experience is a positive one for someone stepping in and not one that feels kind of isolating and tokenizing, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is, I think, what probably happens. You know, I'm not a person of color, but I can probably guess that like that's what happens in Hampshire County is like there's a lot of um, you know, people of color or people who are, um, you know, I maybe even feel that way as a parent sometimes, like if I'm on in a group that doesn't have any parents, I feel like, oh man, I'm like the one who's, you know, really struggling over here because people are screaming in the background, right? So it feels like a lot to step into that role when you're not around people who are having your similar experience, right? Mm -hmm. And then it might be really hard for you to stay in that role. So like, how do we support people? Um, to really uh, feel comfortable there and to feel like that's something that they can like actually grow into and see as part of their life's work, right? I know that's like super lofty and maybe a little bit different than the question you originally asked, Marianne, but that just sort of gives you more of an idea of how um, that could play out with a nonprofit board. It might be a little bit different from a municipal board because of just the process by which municipalities, you know, have to appoint and go through that process. And so I'm learning more about that. Um, and that might be, particularly in Northampton, like if you're looking at all the appointments coming through the mayor, then there's like a centralized way in which there might be some shifts that can be made that's not necessarily specific to each, you know, committee, um, because, it, because it's all happening like in a little bit more of a centralized place. Um, so I'd be actually curious to hear a little bit more if anyone has, um, you know, ideas or kind of just comments or anything you feel moved to share about about the municipal kind of experience of um, expanding representation. Um, and I will just say one more thing that um, I use the word representation, but actually, you know, presence doesn't equal power. So we also have to talk about like the pre the pre the we can have representation without actually having shifts in power, right? Um, and so sometimes we use the word inclusion to say, to sort of speak to that a little bit. Um, it doesn't maybe quite um, put the finger on it, but we're talking about not just boards and committees that look like the community and represent the people most impacted, but also like those people's ability to like really engage effectively and, and to the extent that they want and need to in that board or committee, if that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Sarah, my, my question about community action is with Casa Latina at that point, mm -hmm. which was a great agency. Um, I went to their King's, Night, King's Day that they had. I participated a lot with Casa Latina. 
and then we had to dissolve that. The board tried for several years to try to make things happen, and thank God for Mary Claire Higgins. I mean, she took Casa Latina in, and my concern is even in Ward 6, I have a tremendous amount of Latinos that I associate with, and it's throughout the city, Ward 1, probably Ward 2, whatever. And I, I just think that Community Action is a great organization. And for them, I honored them for doing what they did to help Casa Latina be able to connect with an agency. So that was my concerns with that, because I <laughs> think that they should be commended, because that was a big haul for the director, Mary Claire Higgins, to think of what and how they were going to go ahead with their board to make it happen, to get trainers to come in, to, to have them teach, to be able to speak English. I think it's great. So and another big thing that I question is people with disabilities in our city and even in the schools. That's a biggie with me because I have a disability myself of being deaf in one ear. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like, I wanna know what would you do with the grant to help people with disabilities throughout our city and also in our school systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's an awesome question. And I, I would include people with disabilities or differing abilities on that list of people who are underrepresented at the level of governance and within decision making processes. You know, so I would consider them um, part of the sort of group or groups that we would want to engage in offering training and offering resources to be able to step into leadership positions. That would be great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. Appreciate all that. And I think that there's something specific around people with disabilities in terms of engaging too that's really important to, I need to learn more about, but what does it look like there's so many types of disabilities. Karen has taught me a lot about this. You know, what does it look like for people to engage in, um, in, in meetings and what types of, of accommodations need to happen, right? And so there's learning on the other side that, that I think significant learning that we all as agency people need to have in order to um, accommodate, you know, people in, in those positions. So um, I, again, I think the grant is an opportunity for us to all co-learn together about what that looks like and for people with disabilities to tell us this is what they need. Thank you so much. Would any, Karen, Counselor. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks, um, Counselor Labarge, for, for highlighting that. Um, disability is often a topic that, um, or a, a subset of, of people who are left out of conversations regarding diversity. Um, so I appreciate that you brought that up. And, um, Sarah, I guess I have two thoughts uh, for you about this and goes back to, to what you were talking about earlier and maybe slightly around, it's such a tricky thing because people who are in underrepresented groups need to be able to participate and sort of say what they need in order to be able to participate without also the added pressure of speaking for their group, right? Um, you know, I'm, uh, I just always think of this. I'm a member of the LGBT community, and like sometimes that 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 pressure of like I can't speak for for the whole group, and yet that representation really matters. We received a public comment earlier um, today that I think I, I just wanted to. Um, I know the other counselors would have read it, um, but wanted to mention to you as well, and um, and we can include you on it. One thought that it was is, is around that idea of uh, when you look at nonprofit boards or municipal boards and commissions. There's these two um, ideas, right, where both we want to increase representation and yet also people serving on these boards and commissions needs to have the expertise in the subject matter of the board or commission in order to be able to serve well on the board or commission. And is there a way that we can look at, so there's both increasing the representation, um, but then at, at this point also, um, can we analyze and improve on the outcomes and results of commissions and boards on all members of the community? So is there a way both just look, to look at who is serving and who is making those decisions, right. but then recognizing that maybe the people who are best positioned to serve on, say, the Historical Architecture Commission or something are 
maybe not as diverse. And so is there a way to look at what the training and opening these ideas up in the power structures, but to also ensure or analyze is the work of these boards and commissions, regardless of the representation, what's the impact on the community? And I, I think I just used a whole lot of extra words to say something that was written to us uh, more succinctly, but um, does that make sense to you? Yeah. I think I understand what you're saying and I would, I think I would just say, um, you know, that's, so you gave an example of the historical commission. Is that what you said? Yeah, and that may not have been, been the best example for me to, it was on the tip of my tongue, but just thinking about, let's mm -hmm. say even, for example, say the housing partnership and, and that's one that could absolutely include a whole bunch of different members of our communities with a variety of lived experiences. But say, for example, it doesn't. Um, and, and again, I'm not talking about one specific commission. I just needed one on the tip mm -hmm. of my tongue. But can we be looking at providing training um, and support for boards and commissions, both with the goal of increasing representation, but then also with the goal of increasing um, the impact they're having on all members of our community, rather mm -hmm. than, you know, I think sometimes impact is often um, maybe related to who's represented on these boards and commissions, sometimes the impact isn't inclusive of the entire community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that's like, maybe falls under the, um, the element here of um, just increasing participation and decision making. Um, but I like how you talked about impact, because I mean, I think I've, thought, I've sort of thought less about that, but I think there could be ways to say, what have we done and how has that benefited our community and are there parts of the community that are left out and so that can be that's a reflection that can happen right even without a uh even without engaging the community in that yet um certainly um the what we would be looking for is just greater levels of community participation in decision making and the tools and techniques needed to do that in a way that feels effective right um and i think that um the the, the sort of gold standard or the 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 ultimate aim is to is to increase representation um on those actual boards and committees but you know, we know, and for some of the reasons you cited, um, it's not just, you can't just like install people in those positions. Like <laughs> it's tokenizing. And then it's also like, I mean, I, I was on the um, bike and ped subcommittee in Northampton when I lived here and it took me like a year to understand what they were talking about. And I had like a master's of public health. So I always go back to that. Cause I'm like, Oh, it took me like a really long time to even like, I was like within that, um, I had I had education in that area and I still couldn't engage because it was just so technical and so specific and going so fast. Um, so I really, that was super humbling for me just to realize like even with expertise, there's quite a lot of work, right? That someone has to do to really then know how to participate effectively. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm I'm hearing what you're saying, and I think it's a great point um, of just even looking at yeah how these boards and committees are impacting the community and whether that impact has been you know in the ways that they most want, and if there's parts of the community that they're not impacting that they would like to impact, and how would that what would that look like, and what does that mean for their what does that was that mean for the the way that they're doing their work, right? What what kind of practices might they have to shift in order to do that differently? You know, Sarah, um, talking about, you know, shifting boards and whatever. It took us nine years on the Commission on Disabilities, because I know I really was very strong with my voice on making it happen, and it is. It took us nine years to get closed caption for, for the deaf and hard of hearing. Nine years we fought for this. Meetings galore, and that's all we heard was, yeah, 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 from the CEOs, money, money, money. You know, everything is the evil of all of money. But nine years, and it's happening. And I can't tell you the people that are so happy in this city of being able to have closed caption 
all right, which is mm -hmm. critical for their quality of life, nine years. So, you know, I'm happy about this. And I think many other people deserve to have this quality of life. So that's where I'm at with that. <laughs> Rachel? Yeah, um, I just, I have to say that, you know, one thing I really like about this grant as well is it's not really just about bringing participation to these existing boards and cultures. It's about transforming ultimately those boards mm -hmm. and the cultures on those boards. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're seeing, like what we both alluded to, you know, there's more mothers with young children I, I'm seeing in boards and in government, but it doesn't mean it's easy for them to participate, even if they make it there, right? Uh, so I think that that's just an example, but there's lots of ways in which this will transform on the other end. And I think that's what we, I find that fascinating. Um, and I, I, for one, really would love for the appropriate, um, body, whether it's council or city services or whatever, to, to really look at this, um, the, the application process um, in, in Northampton and see see what what maybe could be changed about that. Or um, it's kind of, I kind of understand it. And frankly, I don't. It's a, it's, so I know it's kind of comes out of the mayor's office. So it's not something, I mean, we also here at city services look at it. But um, so I think that would be really a, a good, very solid place to start. And I hope we get to do some sort of partnership, however minor around that. And I'm also hoping you or whoever you hire, uh, it, would, it would be great if you could come back periodically, you know, to, um, as this unfolds, because I think there'll be a lot to work with there. Sarah, I wanna thank you very, very much for coming in and doing this great presentation. Thank you. Oh. Karen has. Yes, Councillor. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Councillor Barge. I should have asked this earlier. Um, I promise this is my last thought right now. Um, Sarah, one, one question we've been talking about in the City Services Committee um, is looking at starting with a baseline of knowing who's serving on our boards and commissions and demographics. And I recognize that that is only one piece of a much, much, much larger puzzle as far as effective representation and supporting people and participating. Um, but that's something that, that um, we've talked about doing just so we sort of know where are we at right now. Um, and, you know, as, as a city or as a city services committee, I'm really interested in knowing, okay, is, is there outreach or, you know, who's serving and how can, how can we support um, people who are not currently serving and serving. And I didn't know if your grant was planning to take on that work. We have a request in with the mayor's office, but we put that in right before um, the pandemic hit. And, and um, you know, so that's not something that we've really felt like we want to push with the mayor's office. Uh, but I didn't know if, if you would be doing some of that work or if we could work with you on that. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, Thank okay. you, Sarah. Okay. Should I respond? Oh. Yeah, it's almost five o'clock, so go ahead. Okay. Sarah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think um, Rachel and I were talking about this a little bit over email, and um, that's actually one way in which I see we could totally be supportive of municipalities. Um, I think it's more just a question of timing. Um, like, we're not ready right now to work with um, a bunch of municipal like ideally it would be a number of municipalities at once we would be developing a survey tool and we would be working with municipalities on that and then like rolling it out right and so we would sort of all be doing it together or at least maybe a couple of municipalities um so it's it i don't i don't have a lot of clarity on like the timing of it when that would be appropriate to do i certainly have experience in developing survey tools so if it's something that the city wants to move forward with that you wanted to move forward with and you didn't want to wait for sort of us to get our ducks in a row, I would be totally willing to like look at a survey tool and sort of help you figure out if how you're asking those questions feels like the right way to do it. Um, and then if you, but if you weren't anxious to, to collect that data um, really soon um, and wanted to sort of wait and see how the strategic planning process plays out in the spring, um, I could I could really see that as one of the low hanging fruits that comes right out of that process, is that we just kickstart um, a survey tool development and then we work with any municipalities that want to do it. Um, so, 
that's sort of about as clear as mud. Um, but I'll let you sort of let me know um, where you are at in the process and you feel free to just like reach out to me if you would like my involvement earlier um, than, than I would say maybe the spring. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we're ready to. Thank, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate the conversation. Oh, here. Let's, let's continue it later. Okay, we have two new appointments, which was referred to City Council on October 1st. Um, we have Arts Council, Kent Alexander, 174 Island Road, Northampton, term October 2020 through June 2023. Councillor Karen Foster, do you want to go ahead and give us um, your report on your conversation with Kent, please? Yes, I'd be glad to. Um, I had a, a great conversation with Kent last week. Um, and he's interested in the Arts Council um, in part because he is a playwright. Um, he'd lived in New York um, doing labor support. He's the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, advisor for Valley Creates. Um, he's got a really interesting background in that he was the first equity and inclusion officer at Elms College. Um, and then uh, when he retired, uh, he began consulting um, with area nonprofits, and that, that's um, one of the things uh, that's brought him to Valley Creates. Um, he's still an artist. Um, you know, he writes about popular culture. He, um, he's written some books. Um, he's been the president of Earth Dance. And what he's really invested in with Arts Council, which is, um, you know, I think so relevant to this conversation we just had. Um, but two questions we had. One is about sort of how funding is allocated and making sure that that funding for the arts is allocated um, you know across the community which then also goes to the conversation of you know sort of how do we define art um, and just look taking a broader look at art and making sure you had a great quote in this um, ensuring the arts are spread among all deserving people um, but, but sometimes I think um, there can be a view of the arts as being for um, not for everybody and Kent is very very uh, interested and invested um, in broadening um, who's represented both in arts funding and as well as audience for arts um, you know we uh, really appreciated the opportunity to talk to him and, and I moved to make a positive recommendation to his appointment I didn't hear. Councillor Muir, did you say you were seconding it? Yes, sorry. Yes, second. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a positive recommendation to Blue City Council. Is there any discussion? If not, roll call, Laura. Sorry, Laura, you're muted. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay. Um, Northampton House Authority Board of Commission, Jeff Jones. Um, Jeff and I had a lengthy talk and I really enjoyed talking with him, especially with the union and so forth. And I learned a lot from Jeff. Anyways, he's been on the Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissioners since 2008. And he was asked to replace Councillor Carney as the organized labor representative on the board. Central to the mission of organized labor is a commitment to affordable housing. And that is true. I feel we as a board are on an uptick and the way we have approached our tenants and the community at large. Speaking of the tenants, one of my goal has always been a stable, active tenants association at each major site, and that is happening. As an organization, the Northampton Housing Authority is allocated one seat on the Community Preservation Committee, and he represents that authority. One of the main areas of focus of the CPC is affordable housing. In addition, was a great feeling to help the CPC bring funding 
to for the recreational playground to be constructed at Hampshire Heights property in the near future. Jeff anyways would be highly honored to be appointed for another term on the Northampton Housing Board and this is also a reappointment on Jeff Jones. I make a positive recommendation to full city council. Second. All in favor? Oh, you're muted again, Laura. So May Laura, I do a roll call? Laura, I'd like to do a, a roll call okay. on that, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Oh, all my paperwork here. Okay. Is there any new business? Do we have uh, topics for next time? Yes, thank you. Um, Laura and I were talking today and I had mentioned last month about having Donna Lascalia come in from the Department of Public Works for the month of December, which I think is great timing. And I know right now that DPW is getting all lined up. They've gotten their trucks all getting ready for plowing and so forth like that. But I think it would be very interesting because I have talked with Donna Lascalia several times about how she is doing since she has laid off staff and the upkeep. They've been really busy throughout the whole summer and up to the fall. So anyways, Laura and I were talking, we could have Donna Lascalia come in and either having, she mentioned something about the recycling, if not having, um, Police Chief um, Jody Casper come in. So what would you decide? I'm definitely going to have Donna Lascalia come in first. And I'm going to limit these so that, because this was a long presentation today for this meeting. So I would like to have Donna Lascalia come in and maybe do her for like 20 minutes, because we don't know how many appointments we're going to be getting coming aboard. So I need to be careful here. Um, so who would you like? Would you like Jody Casper to come in also? Or, um, yes, Laura. No, I don't have a preference, of course, but I was just saying that I had mentioned the solid waste coordinator, um, I, think it, I can't remember her first oh, name, Susan uh, Waite. Susan Waite, yeah. Only because the plastic reduction and sustainability ordinance is coming before the council soon. And there's so many questions. Jim Nash, I know, is really trying to get information on the city's waste stream now and what provisions there are for handling compostable materials when more of them start coming online. So, you know, I just suggested that idea. Um, I know they're working on it in community resources, but that I think that would be great. I brought that yeah, up. Who did you say? Susan Susan White? She's the um, solid waste coordinator for the city of Northampton. And what's the name again? I can't hear you. Susan Waite. I believe it's W-A-I-T. Uh, I think it's W-A-I-T-E. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The only right, thing, I was gonna say, the only thing about that is I, I think that would be great, but do we need then a referral of the plastic reduction ordinance oh, or we need a referral to city right, services? You know I didn't what? even think of that. We have a referral coming at city council this week for it to come to the Commission on Disabilities. Huh. Uh, I talked with Councillor Nash and because last month, because of Columbus Day weekend, um, our ADA coordinator forgot to put it up on the website and we were gonna talk about that. So we're behind on that. So Jim Nash is telling me that he doesn't think that this will be voted on in the month of December and it's something that we really can't rush into because right now in the Commission on Disabilities, which is being brought up next Tuesday, is on the plastics. There's some concerns for people with disabilities, with the straws and so forth like that. And Karen, you probably know you deal with people with different types of disabilities. So I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem of bringing her in. 
So, Laura, if it's something that's just informational, it still has to be referred. It's, I, that's what I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of city services making a report to council, or right. yeah, I was just thinking of it as being informational. informational. And it could be too that Jim Nash maybe he hasn't managed to get her, but he may be trying to get her to come into community resources too, and then I guess it would yeah. be redundant. Uh, I, but I would believe that she would be coming here to talk about her general role, not. Not necessarily plastics fan, but I guess right. yeah. That just, I, I I'm that, curious about her general role because I only yeah. learned about her uh, once we started working on the, the plastics fan, Frankly, and I, I've talked to her a little bit. It seems really fascinating. I'd like to know more what she does in a general sense. I agree. But, I think I think Councillor Muir is absolutely correct. I'd be very, very concerned. I want to know myself about her general role. But yeah. Hmm. <laughs> It's up to whatever your counselors want want to do. If you want they were right to come in, that's fine. Does Council so command. just to be clear, she she reports to Donna Lascalia, right? And there there that's the chain of command there. That's so it true. would be two people from the DPW. I th I think that sounds pretty appropriate and yeah. you know, we'll we kind of we on the same track. Sure. If the other counselors are in agreement, I am as well. I am I'm in agreement. No. Yeah. Okay. I'd be so interested. I, I, I get asked a lot about trash barrels too. Can't put a trash barrel here, and so I'd love to hear this general question. Good one to ask about. Yes. <laughs> so, so maybe I could just because I made the information request today for Donna Lascalia for December. So, if I were to just expand that to include, if possible, yes. Sarah, yes. Susan Wade. Yes. Great. Yes, because that Thank way, Donna, being the director, you know, she might want to have some input too when Susan's talking. That's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. All right. So, anyways, good plan. I know of no other business. Do we need a final motion? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night. That's to be a roll call. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Roll follower. <laughs> yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. We can say we did. So. Yes. Good to see you all. Yeah, Have a good day right. tomorrow. Have a good Hello, day. Everyone. Everyone. Safe. Bye, Bye. Yeah, Sarah. Everybody Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye. I'm glad you guys invited her in. That was very interesting. Yeah. That was yeah. really good. Rachel, give me a call. We'll meet down at the brewery. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Right there, or I don't know. Or what the, send up, send up the bad signal some, for the rest of us if you do. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna find some trained therapists just in case. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow night. I don't know what I'm gonna do. So. <laughs> Mary, you, yeah. Mary, you can your bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll put you on my double trailer, and we'll go to the brewery if we're gonna make it through tomorrow. Perfect. 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 Bring the puppy. <laughs> the puppy likes to eat things. All right. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Good night. Laura, next meeting yes. is but at six thirty. Uh, my yes, ours, yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you soon. I hope I did all right. You did great, actually. I thought Sarah did great. It was very interesting. She's very, very good at that discussing. Was a long presentation. It was. I have to be really careful with this. I think that was. Yeah, I hope. Um, I yeah, I don't think Jim Nash would have any objection to sitting. I, I mean, I just thought of that as like. Rachel said being informational for everybody, you know, about well, I think the best I think Rachel covered it. Right. I definitely covered it. Well, you know, and you guys are going to be perhaps getting questions from business owners and residents who are constituents and wondering, you know, about this waste ban and where the waste is going to go. And so, you know, it, it's good information. To, I, I, I agree with Rachel. Yeah. I, I want to know more about her role. Right, right. Well, we're going to be coming up to doing budget hearings and that mm -hmm. the financial part of this right down the line. Right, you know, right. As far as the plastics, I want to know exactly what her role is all about. Yeah, yeah. And what's being done now for recycling exactly. and composting, what kind of programs are in place. Yeah, right. I agree. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>